How are you, Jamie? Yeah, I'm fine. How are you, Christian? I'm oh, good. It's been a while. See you on, see you on Monday. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> okay, it's hit three o'clock on my computer. So um, welcome, everybody, to the final panel of Viral Masculinities, of what's been a very successful conference. Um, I say the final panel, we have our keynote uh, tonight, which uh, Joao will talk to you about uh, at the end of this panel. Um, it's called, this panel is called Masculinities, Responsibility and Safer Sex. Um, we've got Angelus, Angelos Bolas speaking, Chase Ledden and Christian Moller co-presenting, and Jordana Greenblatt. And it will, this panel will go like every other panel has uh, during the conference. Um, we'll, I'll introduce everyone and their papers um, as they speak, um, and there'll be questions and answers at the end of the session. Please feel free to use the chat for comments or questions, which I can pick up um, and pose to the panel at the end of, uh, of when they speak. So um, I think we'll start now um, with our first paper um, by Angelus Bolas, who is a PhD candidate at Dublin City University. His research focuses on contemporary representations of HIV suffering in culture and popular media. And today he'll be uh, presenting a paper called Undetectable Equals Untransmittable or Detectable Equals Danger. U Equals U Campaign Narratives of Dis-Ease, Homonormativity and Social Exclusion. So over to you, Angelos. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jamie. Here we are. Okay, super. Um, so earlier, um, this summer, I was reading Emma for possibly the 10th time and just came to realise a, a parallel, if you like, between Emma's journey and the PhD um, process. So if there is anything that truly captures me in this period of my life is reflected in these two pictures whereby Emma thinks that she knows everything pretty well and then she realises that maybe, just maybe, that's not the case. And this happened to me when I initially submitted a proposal for this conference and then I read the programme and found out who the other presenters are. So I'm humbled and grateful to be in such good company. And of course, um, I thought I would take advantage of you all and present you with some of my own questions. So my background is in education. I believe in asking rather than telling. So really uh, today's presentation will be me uh, starting with, if you like the basis, so to speak, of my thinking process. And then I'll present you with my main questions. So I hope that this will initiate a conversation and I'm looking forward to your comments and thoughts afterwards. So let's um, start. So in, um, in Positive Images, Kagan analyzes the sociocultural implications of the ways in which HIV AIDS came to be represented. And by combining Kagan's analysis with uh, Bourdieu's theory of social field and Foucault's theories of identification, it emerges that in mainstream representations of HIV AIDS, there are two subject positions presented to audiences. One subject position entails characteristics which are acceptable and celebrated by the society, and one other subject position which is always represented in comparative terms to the mainstream one and is always found to be lacking something, ranging from a stable physical health to an accepted position within mainstream society. Therefore, when it comes to representations of HIV AIDS, we observe hegemony of othering at play. When subject positions are being represented in comparison to one another, power formations and subjectivization are created. During the initial years of the epidemic, we observe representations which position HIV AIDS positive men primarily in relation to their heterosexual counterparts. The representations of the latter enforced the ideals of heterosexual masculinity, as uh, Halkitis put it, maleness, masculinity, sexual aggressiveness, and virility. End of quote. While HIV AIDS masculinities were associated with weakness, disease, and death. Moving therefore away from um, representing non-heterosexual men as effeminate and instead associating them with contagion 
and disease resulted in absolute stigmatization and isolation of the HIV AIDS infected man, which was also then extended to the non-heterosexual man, irrespective of their being infected or not. In the 1990s, there um, has been a shift in the representation of HIV AIDS masculinities, not in as much as the way they themselves were being represented, but more crucially in the way they were being represented in relation to non-HIV AIDS infected gay masculinities. In Reality Bites, for instance, in contrast to his likely presentation had the drama aired in the 80s, Sami is shown to be celibate. The image of the promiscuous gay man whose lifestyle will inevitably lead him to contracting AIDS is now being replaced by the image of the desexualized gay character. However, the association between AIDS and promiscuity is not absent from this drama. Even though we're not being presented with an AIDS infected character, Sammy's best friend and housemate, Vicky, expresses her fears about the possibility of contracting AIDS as a result of sexual promiscuity. Despite the fact that there is no physical presence of an AIDS infected character, viral masculinities are being represented in absentia here as promiscuous and deathly, which are to be avoided. The, their representation is situated relationally to non-viral but homosexual masculinities who are in turn desexualized and reduced to coming out narratives. In other words, in the 1990s, HIV AIDS is represented in order to be disavowed. The disavowal of HIV AIDS includes the desexualization of the gay character and to quote Kagan rituals of symbolic purification, including domestic labor, the obsessive eradication of dirt, the symbolic burial of the AIDS body, and the renunciation of people living with HIV AIDS, end of quote. Similar representations of gay, uh, of gay in opposition to HIV positive men are found in a variety of mainstream films and TV series of the period. Examples include Philadelphia, Ellen, The Birdcage, In and Out, My Best Friend's Wedding, The Object of My Affection, Dawson's Creek, and The Queen Herself in The Next Best Thing. In the first two decades of the pandemic, viral masculinities were presented within a binary system, if you like, whereby in the 80s there was the heterosexual on the one end and the AIDS infected or soon to be infected on the other end of the binary. In the 90s, there was the desexualized gay man on the one end and the promiscuous, disease-bearing gay man on the other end. Further to that, the way each binary was positioned constructed power formations between the two ends with a non-infected end of each binary being presented as the norm, while the other, the infected or potentially infected one, stands for all that is to be repudiated. Here, Kristeva's concept of objection enables an understanding of the function of the other. Following her thought, the subject position offered by the representation of viral masculinities is one of the object. It is through the repudiation of viral masculinities that heterosexual, heterosexuals in the 80s and non-infected gay men in the 90s can maintain, can maintain a dominant position in society. Situating this trend in representation of viral masculinities within the sociocultural context of the time highlights a parallel with what has, happening, has been happening in uh, activism. On the one hand, there was the AIDS activism, and on the other, the 90s marked the emergence of gay activism. AIDS activism centered around the organization ACT UP and its ongoing efforts to improve the lives of people living with HIV AIDS, while gay activism is following a more assimilationist direction by highlighting the similarities between homosexual and heterosexual people in order to allow the former to assimilate into normalcy. This assimilationist tendency manifests itself in representations of viral masculinities of the third decade of the pandemic. In depictions of viral masculinities of the noughties, we are presented with the buff body, which signifies an anxiety 
to associate viral masculinities with an ideal physical existence. In Queer as Folk, we're presented with an HIV positive character, Ben, who unlike HIV positive characters of the previous decades, appears to be healthy with a strong muscular body. Ben also functions as a vehicle for the series to discuss serodiscordant relationships and indeed the series is groundbreaking in that it portrays a contemporary reality of HIV people, um, HIV positive people and unlike what was being portrayed in previous decades, the HIV positive person is not represented within a binary involving heterosexual or HIV negative gay men. Among other things, the series focuses on issues of social stigmatization and exclusion of HIV positive people by both the heterosexual and the homosexual community. There is a highlighted emphasis on the struggles that Ben goes through in order for him to be socially accepted, namely adopting a healthy lifestyle, which includes numerous hours at the gym and a fixation with his body image, being educated to the highest level, maintaining financial independence and seeking a monogamous romantic life, all of which are ideals that have culturally been associated with heterosexual masculinity. Here, I want to return to the discussion of subject positions in relation to viral masculinities by focusing on a new binary created by their representation in this series. One of Ben's activities includes volunteering and offering psychological support to newly diagnosed HIV positive men. In the third season, Ben offers shelter to a teenage man, Hunter, who is HIV positive. It is through the relationship between Ben and Hunter that the series creates a new binary. Ben is portrayed as a fully realized individual for whom another a uh, character of the series says that he's perfect, except for one thing, referring to him being HIV positive. Hunter, though, is a teenage prostitute who lives on the streets. In a similar fashion to the binaries created in the 1980s and the 1990s, we are now presented with a new one. On the one hand, there is the subject position of the HIV positive man who works hard to redeem himself for, from whatever led him to contract HIV and enjoys to a certain extent the privileges of a normative life, while on the other hand we are presented with a reckless and promiscuous HIV positive man who exhibits no signs of remorse and is socially excluded and isolated. In other words, the third decade of the virus offers us representations of viral masculinities which illustrate hegemonic othering, even though not us clearly as with earlier representations of our own masculinities. The representation of two subject positions enables the construction of power formations between the dominant one and the other. Through such representations, viral masculinities are proven to have been consistently situated in the position of the other, resulting in the stigmatization of the HIV positive individual on three accounts against heterosexual masculinities, against non-heterosexual HIV negative masculinities, and against HIV positive but conforming masculinities. In the fourth decade of the virus, these representations persisted through the emergence of the AIDS heritage and AIDS retrovision genres, both of which were criticized by Kagan for contributing to situating HIV and AIDS in the distant past, suggesting that it is not a matter of concern any longer. Kagan argues that this is an effect of neoliberal homonormative politics, whereby the attention has shifted to securing legal and social recognitions that benefit conforming non-heterosexual individuals, but further stigmatizing those who reject the norms altogether. This begs the question of how, if at all, representation can be used to ease and possibly alleviate the effects of hegemonic othering in relation to people living with HIV and AIDS. And here comes my question about the uh, U equals U campaign. 
based on my earlier discussion on the creation of power formations as a result of subject positions presented in narratives and representations of viral masculinities, I argue that undetectable equals untransmittable campaign cannot but reinforce a binary in which the undetectable assumes a privileged and possibly celebrated position against the one whose viral load has not reached or cannot reach undetectable levels. Is, my question is, is the undetectable one the new Ben? And where does this leave the new Hunter? Where does this leave those of our community who are being deprived of access to medical treatment? Those who have still not come to terms with their being positive and have not started their treatment, or those with no access to testing, those whose treatment perhaps is not working as effectively. So even though I sincerely applaud the U equals U campaign and any campaign which puts pressure on governments and medical institutions to focus on HIV AIDS and not treat it as a remnant of the distant past, my question is, what the message that we communicate to the society at large is and how we can make sure that everyone in our community feels respected, part of a diverse whole and welcome. Thank you. Great, Angelus, thank you. That was great. Um, a really lovely kind of survey of representations of HIV and some really pertinent questions at the end which um, I'm sure we're going to pick up and there's already a lot of discussion in the chat with some interesting questions there. So uh, moving on to our next uh, presentation um, by Chase Edden and Christian Muller. Muller, I hope I'm saying it right, no one ever gets my name right so yeah that will fine. Okay, I don't feel so bad. Um, Christian Miller is a postdoc at the IT University of Copenhagen, studying the intersection of media technology and LGBTQ sexuality and culture. Um, current work centers on drug and media use in queer male sex practices, typically referred to as chemsex. Uh, through new materialist and assemblage theories, he approaches the complex circulation and modulation of action and affect in the chemsex event. Um, his co-presenter, Chase Leiden, is a PhD candidate at the University of Edinburgh. His research explores the histories and representations of post-AIDS in sociology and cultural theory. He's interested in the politics of HIV, STI treatment and prevention, pedagogical approaches to sexual health education and the sociology of health and illness. I believe that your title has changed, so I'm not going to read out the old title. Um, I'll just hand it straight over to you guys and, and you can talk about what you're going to talk about. Thanks, Jamie. So I'm going to start here and then Christian will pull up on the, the second half of the presentation. So let me get this pulled up real quick. Um, okay, yeah, we didn't have a, a massive change in the, in the title, um, if you can see this. And, uh, but uh, there is a, just a, a wee difference here. Um, so we're talking about viral ontology today and this presentation is based on a paper that Christian and I wrote and have forthcoming in a collected book. Um, so, the biomedical potential of HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis should and does invite hopefulness, but the fact remains that whilst in attitudes about its integration seem to be changing, there is a persistence of negative responses. These affective orientations, both positive and negative, good and bad, ethical and unethical, do not foreclose the futures that PrEP makes available. Rather, we suggest that these effective attachments reinstall modes of relationality based on fear of HIV through a persistence or temporal drag of ideologies and materialities over time. So we start by considering how PrEP is haunted by effective attachments. Our study clarifies previous studies about HIV ontology by synthesizing the multiple forms of spectrality that have emerged alongside biomedical consumption looking closely at affective attachments to these biomedicines, material prophylaxis, and their circulation within digital infrastructures. We employ the concept of viral ontology to illuminate how old technologies and their social lives fold over and into new ones. In the folding process, we suggest that multiple meanings associated with biomedicines and prophylaxis drag through and attach to social infrastructures. By remaining attentive to how these affective attachments drag within infrastructures, 
we can imagine other more inclusive gay sociosexual futures. Um, okay, so as a baseline, our study suggests that PrEP circulates within an effective economy. Affects and material innovations accrue alongside and with the development of PrEP and therefore saturate the significance and use of PrEP. We use the following case studies to demonstrate how previous affective values reattach to new prevention technologies and haunt their construction during the processes of socio-medical interpretation and the cultural negotiation and production of PrEP's significance. So to generate a deeper understanding of the affects that attach to PrEP, the project draws from queer theory and HIV sociology. These fields have variously reflected on the hauntologies of AIDS, but have not formalized effective accounts of its ongoing attachments to PrEP. In deploying an a hauntological analysis, we assess how past and present materials and ideas affect, uh, sorry, affect and it might affect those living with so-called post within post-AIDS communities. We call on Derrida's conception of the specter, Sarah Ahmed's conception of the ghost-like fi ghost figure, and Elizabeth Freeman's analysis of temporal drag to investigate how these affects linger within these communities. Our thinking is inspired by Kane Race's mobilization of actor network theory, in which he considers how HIV and AIDS work on gay life through complex flows of chemical, digital, and communal infrastructures. Extending this research into the field of affect theory, we analyzed two case studies to demonstrate how notions of virality and affective attachments haunts both chemical and digital infrastructures. So we're gonna to move to the first case study now. And the first case study here is about the prep whore and the virtuous containment of semen. So first documented in San Francisco in 2014, the prep whore was devised to shame gay men using prep. The term was originally employed as an epithet to decry how those who use prep are somehow taking a, a prevention shortcut to cop out from the responsible use of condoms. The prep whore belongs to a genealogy of panic icons like those of the early AIDS crisis, including homosexuals, Haitians, heroin users, hemophiliacs, etc. The rejection and shaming of the prep whore has driven heteronormative respectability politics and encouraged perceptions of good and bad sexual practices. But the figure of the prep whore is not simply a negative embodiment of biomedical consumption. As Derrida helps us to think, the specter, which is at once malignant and benign, is figured according to the viewer's idealization of the entity. In these terms, the prep whore is imbued with effective multiplicity that draws attention not simply to the negative discourses that suture the individual to what Dion Kagan has called re-crisis discourse, but also proliferates ideas about effective fluidity and plurality, um, including conflicting desires. Largely, the prep whore is a spectoral figure that embodies multiple and often conflicting affective structures, a subject we understand as embodied, enlivened, and perpetually co-constituted by interactions with biomedical consumption and sexual engagement. So considering the prep whore as a spectral figuration allows us to think about the use and deployment of intervention strategies, specifically the relationship between prep and the condom's dominance in gay sexual health practice. The genealogy of PrEP has as its ongoing organizing principle the containment of semen materially, while it is the effect, not the bile transfer, that is the function that properly describes the condom's use in HIV prevention. Over time, it is the very separation of fluids that becomes the, the object to which effective states of safety and responsibility stick and accumulate. It is the literal exchange of fluids that is made to feel corrupted, even if there are, is no viral presence within those fluids. Effectively, for those who signify the prep whore disparagingly, the condom retains the feeling of safety. It is a rigid sexual technology that is effectively and ontologically safe. Whilst this is based on an, its effectiveness in reducing HIV infection, we would argue that over time the condom loses effective intensity a value that in turn haunts PrEP by making insensitivity a sign of virtue. In this effective economy, the latex separation of genitals and the containment of fluids becomes the primary way that normative sexual practices and transgressions emerge and diverge. 
denying oneself the pleasure of fluids entering orifices to instead keep semen in its proper place inside the condom becomes the vehicle of virtuous sex. The associated loss of sensation in condom use becomes entangled with the notions of respectability and responsibility. The modulation of sensation by the, light, the latex condom is made to feel, if not good, then at least right, creating an effective anchoring to the ethics of how safer sex should feel. This normative configuration of what counts as virtuous or sensual or right induces temporal drag as it attaches itself to prep. The process creates a figuration, i.e. the prep whore, that operates within a new set of materialities, one that reapplies an effective orientation from previous viral epistemologies. We argue that it is the ethics of fluid containment that over time becomes unfixed from the condom as a technology that allows fear of semen out of place to travel through the, the social normativity of hookup app culture and haunt the prep regimen. The effective investments that sediment around condoms may break loose, reorienting their effective significance in order to reattach to prep and modulate its very social existence. This leaves us with a reminder that nothing mandates a right way to use prep, rather multiple forms of use, including conflicting perceptions of what is good or right, emerge from prep's effective attachments. So over to you, Christian. Cool, thank you. And um, <clears throat> so if we change the slide, Chase. There you go. So now we move from the chemo prophylactics to hookup apps, another infrastructure for gay sexual sociability. The importance of hookup apps to LGBTQ people's sexual sociability is well described and pretty obvious by now. Um, therefore, considering their effective and digital characteristics are important when studying the social and temporal life of HIV virality. Concretely, to understand viral ontology within hookup apps, uh, we compare the design of two apps, Grindr and Scruff. Specifically, we compare the ways that they work as framing devices for communication about sex and HIV. Um, so in the profile editor, um, under the headline sex, Scruff on the left invites disclosure of safety practices. I've highlighted that in the red circle, which includes condoms, PrEP, and treatment as prevention. In doing so, Scruff frames negotiations of sex and safety as a practice that the users might adopt or might not. As such, Scruff materializes and enforces a specific historical tradition of zero status non disclosure, that is, uh, a traditional policy of assuming any of their casual partners could be HIV positive in racist words in 2010. Such an ethos is adapted in order to enable sex, minimize further infection, all the while distributing the discursive work and effective load uh, across people living both with and without HIV. Conversely, uh, if we look to the other side, um, under the heading sexual health, grinder asks the user to disclose HIV status uh, and, and to choose between do not show, negative, negative on PrEP, positive, and positive undetectable. The options combine the status of viral load in the body with any uh, HIV medical regimes that minimize risks of viral transfer and zero uh, conversion. So we argue that by offering the self-identification category HIV negative uh, next to, for example, positive, Grindr designs uh, falsely, well, it falsely imagines a binary in which the, uh, the non-zero converted body is knowable in the same way as the zero converted one. Put simply, this iteration of the Grindr interface sustains the understanding that being HIV negative is something we can know and feel in the same way as HIV positivity, uh, that positive body. So avoiding speculation about concrete design or knowledge and intentions, the fact that this interface designs uh, remains uncontested indicates how highly valued the negative body is among designers and its users. The epistemological uncertainty of the HIV negative negativity category is erased, which in turn makes it possible for it to operate within the strict logical framework of a drop-down uh, disclosure menu 
with its requirements of uniformity and completeness of choice. But what operations, operations and slippages might make these situations possible to begin with? If we can change the slide. Um, one way to answer these questions goes through the viral ontological analyses. In this framework, the deliberate focus on HIV disclosure of, uh, of Grindr can be seen as less the interface being haunted and more the interface chasing after the epistemological phantasmagoria of HIV negativity. As the HIV negative body is socially valued uh, and socially valued instance of the gay body, its very introduction and circulation as a disclosure practice commands grinder users to keep looking for it. Even though they will never be able to reliably identify HIV negative bodies, the infrastructural organization Grinder nevertheless extends the historical focus on HIV positive bodies to HIV negative ones. All things equal, this intensifies the zero status inquiry and disclosure ethos that so readily reproduces HIV stigma. As such, previously installed viral discourses like inevitable transmission continue to operate as a ghost-like figure, sedimenting fear and dread. Applying Ahmed's analysis reveals that what is going on is what she calls an, an anticipation of a future injury. The ability of the HIV negative figure to produce new effective relations is thus not merely based on its materiality as a real thing. In fact, it is its very immateriality that allows it to become unfixed from its initial material basis and operate as a referent that ripples and accumulates and warps multiple HIV epistemological epistemologies across time. Now, in conclusion, our analyses have brought uh, out the ways feelings of sexual uh, ethical virtue might be produced in relationship to specific safer sex technologies and how these normative orientations are translated across time and, and reattached to new technologies. Contemporary gay sex culturalism's investment in the non-zero converted body materializes in queer hookup disclosure options. This works as a device to reframe HIV service status with the purpose of creating sexual encounters seemingly free of HIV AIDS history. Assisted by Freeman's analysis of contemporality as constituted by temporal lag, we are wary of the notion of a prep revolution. We think that such a claim lends itself to a narrative bracketing of the histories of HIV AIDS, which prematurely signifies the end of HIV AIDS and eliminates the prevalence of HIV in the production of contemporary gay spaces, sexualities, and sociabilities. Instead, we have shown that PrEP emerges as another chemical infrastructure for gay sociability, haunted by HIV AIDS history, and one that must be understood in relationship to other safer sex infrastructures. Further, the, the viral uh, haunting associated with PrEP moves through hookup apps infrastructures and is calibrated in relationship to their designs. As such, it works to partially retain effective sediments from, from previous epistemological interpretations of HIV AIDS. And crucially, the privileging of HIV negativity continues to be lodged in these uh, structures. The configuration of orality, the healthy body, and sustainable, sustainable gay sexuality draw on effective registers that develop and accumulate across times of crisis and post-crisis. Um, and that's it for us. Uh, here's the, the reference for the future uh, uh, book section. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Chase and Christian. That was very uh, thought provoking. Um, okay, we move on to our final speaker, um, Jordana Greenblatt, who teaches at York University. And it says in your bio, U of T. I think, is that University of Texas? University of Toronto. You're in Toronto. There you go. Um, that was clever. Um, recent publications include articles exploring consent in BDSM, representations of HIV in safer sex educational comics and graphic memoir, and a collection, Querying Consent, which is published by Rutgers University Press. They perform regularly as a semi-professional aerial acrobat and choreographer. Um, today, Jordana is going to be speaking uh, well, is going to be presenting a paper called Absolute Bottom, 
risk, top supremacy, queer theory, and the prep debates. So over to you, Jordana. Thank you. So prep, um, hey. I could just spotlight myself. Um, PrEP initially approached as a development likely to be broadly popular among queer men as soon as it became available, was quickly criticized after its 2012 FDA approval by, among others, Michael Weinstein, Dan Savage, and Zachary Quinto, though some have backtracked to varying degrees, um, as diminishing queer men's community responsibility and mutual respect. Both PrEP and its criticisms are conventionally compared to the pill, um, but in terms of more recent discourses, generally gay, not queer male criticisms of PrEP as purportedly increasing promiscuity and decreasing community responsibility, more closely replicate conservative Christian objections to vaccinating adolescent girls to prevent future HPV infection echoing connections that Leo Bersani identifies between heterosexual anxieties about promiscuous women and sexually receptive gay men. In short, these discourses mobilize various often contradictory investments in the risk experienced by those who get fucked, people we might characterize as bottoms regardless of gender. Bersani praises sexual receptivity's threat to the heteromasculine coherent subject. Catherine von Stockton later explores the value of the bottom and debasement in black and or queer representations and experience. Such philosophically generative reclamations of bottomly subjective risk exist alongside normative institutionalizations of bottomly health risk in order to position women and or bottoms as the moral custodians of sexual restraint. Insisting that disproportionate health risks experienced by bottoms, whatever their gender, should not be mitigated by biotechnological intervention, less respectful community crumble, positions vulnerability as the price bottoms must pay to ensure the social responsibility of implicitly masculine and subjectively unassailable tops. As such, bottomly risk functions discursively in two distinct ways. It is both owned and disavowed by queer appropriations that celebrate its subjectivity shattering potential, while often disingenuously forgetting its bottomly specificity. And alternately, it is defended as the guarantor of good, responsible, respectful behavior on the part not only of those who get fucked, but those fuckers who at least want to fuck them as well. Both inflated and minimized bottomly risk is claimed in the former discourse as queer theoretical subversion of the norm and erased in its specifically receptive capacity, while in the latter it's presented as a necessary and desirable deterrent to bad behavior, but also adequately dealt with via the very deterrence it supposedly enforces. Before coming back to biomedical interventions and STI transmission that are so suspect to both gay and Christian fundamentalist advocates of community and respect, I explore the centrality of bottoming to theoretical celebrations of erotic risk as subversively challenging the self and the occlusion of bottoms within them. So I'll come back to the issue of HIV risk in transmission via Tim Dean's, ultimately I suggest quite conservative work on barebacking. Given his reliance on Sonny, my engagement theorists antagonistic to Dean, such as David Halperin in sort of in similar ways, um, as well as other theorists who draw on Bersani like Stockton. Tops and bottoms of any sex or gender can't be essentialized as distinct and non-overlapping categories. Many people are versatile. Anyone who bottoms regularly is subject to the kinds of philosophical and or biomedical risk at hand. However, I do wanna draw a provisional dividing line between fuckable subjects and tops. That is people who rarely or never get fucked, be they gay self-professed total tops or the kinds of straight men with hyperbolically fortified anal defenses. In queer theoretical erotic risk, framed as variously as jouissance, objection, or something else, risky subjects aren't so much gay as penetrable. 
implying a distance between tops and bottoms vaster and more philosophically relevant than between the sexes of people who bottom. Discussing promiscuity sex panics, Bersani notes, quote, the widespread confusion in heterosexual and homosexual men um, between fantasies of anal and vaginal sex. Bersani ascribes the, quote, extraordinary power to penetrability itself, not homosexuality per se, an image in which, quote, women and gay men spread their legs with an unquenchable appetite for destruction and, quote, a grown man, legs high in the air, is unable to refuse the suicidal ecstasy of being a woman. Is the rectum a grave associates the erotophilosophically desirable, quote, nightmare of ontological obscenity, the prospect of a breakdown of the human itself in sexual intensities, a kind of selfless communication with the lower orders of being, with bottoming, not sex between men per se. Stockton's Beautiful Bottom, Beautiful Shame focuses on debasement as an experience in which both queers and African Americans may establish, quote, social holdings, being held in the arms or in the mind of another. In the dictionary de definition of debasement, Stockton locates conjunctions between that which is lowered in value and that which is rendered impure between debasement and different concepts of bottom, quote, the physical material lowering I discuss in reference to the bottom, the body's bottom, including queer anality, but also just as centrally the bottom of one's mind and by economic reference, the lowest end, the bottom that is of an economic scale. In Stockton's framework, the bottom, debasement or bottoming all have prospectively redemptive attributes as she puts it, quote, debasement is seductive. And these overlap with lowered value and objection. Objection is itself, of course, central to many strains of queer theory. For example, if somewhat counterintuitively, Halperin's What Do Gay Men Want? Seeking a non-psychoanalytic explanation for what draws gay men to condomless sex, Halperin identifies objection as motivation, but also as a site of queer resistance. Resonating with Bersani, he argues that, quote, the value of objection may lie in its promotion of self-abandonment. Objection may consist in simply losing yourself in an all-important project, putting other things ahead of your ego. Halperin presents abjection as a political strategy insofar as it unsettles the ego or the self. And here, too, it has to do specifically with bottoming. Discussing a, a scene from the Thief's Journal in which Jean Genet has been arrested, the contents of his pockets mocked by the police, Halperin identifies Genet's tube of Vaseline as, quote, the token of gay sex itself in all its antisocial splendor, its filthiness, its disgracefulness, its thrills, its delirious risks and dangers, its defiance, its surprising strength as the source of instinctive, unconquerable pride and resistance. This splendor is of course actually the splendor of bottoming. Though leveraging it as a function of gay male sex in general, Halperin describes the tube of Vaseline as standing for quote, Genet's homosexuality, his filthiness, his prostitution, his poverty, his youth, his subordination, his vulnerability, his anal receptivity, his sexual passivity, his emasculation. In short, Halperin claims to make an argument about gay sex when he's really discussing bottoming specifically. In this, Halperin expresses surprising commonality with Dean. In Unlimited Intimacy, Dean claims that barebackers embrace a form of erotophilosophically desirable and subjectively unsettling risk that intersects with health risk. Basing, an argument, basing his arguments on an edifice whose indebtedness to the specificity of bottoming he ignores. Dean's monograph is written from the perspective of a top, largely alighting that perspective's specificity. While he doesn't explicitly write, I am a top, Dean's self-narration suggests that he's not a fuckable subject. Accounts of specific sexual interactions are of Dean fucking others, and his discussion of risk reduction strategies implies that this is his norm. 
Bottoming carries a significantly higher risk of zero conversion than topping, which Dean's preferred strategy, strategic positioning, relies on, with positive partners bottoming and negative partners topping in prospectively high-risk situations. Having already disclosed his HIV negative status, Dean informs readers that strategic positioning is, quote, a strategy I regularly adopt when barebacking with strangers. In addition to its obvious limitations, however, strategic positioning works best when the parties involved already prefer the strategic sexual role that the technique prescribes. It does not work for HIV negative men who love getting fucked in the ass. The implication is that Dean is not such a man. Dean's specificity undermines his theoretical mobilization of the concept of risk in a number of ways. Insofar as it relies on the allure of health risk specifically, Dean is in a place of experiencing less risk while claiming the subjectivity shattering benefits of more without addressing the differentials in health risk that significantly distance the experience of bottoms from his. Since Dean professes that, in his experience, HIV status is not discussed in bareback interactions, it is unclear whether his risk reduction strategy is shared and relational, or rather relies on misrecognition. Discussing the shortcomings of serosorting, Dean refers to the empirically supported failure in communication that makes it, quote, easy to assume that a willingness to bareback means that the other guy must have the same status as oneself. Given, the example, given that the example he uses is of an HIV positive top and an HIV negative bottom making wrong assumptions, it's actually impossible to tell whether the situation is a failure of zero sorting or of strategic positioning. This conflation of strategies is enabled by, at best, minimally recognizing the imbalance in risk inherent to topping and bottoming, especially when one seems to only ever top. Zero sorting and strategic positioning involve fundamentally asymmetrical risks when practiced by HIV negative tops versus HIV negative bottoms. Related to this is the elision of bottomly specificity in theoretical celebration of barebacking subversive potential. Drawing on Bersani to argue, quote, repudiating limits entails a distance a discipline of challenging to the point of dissolution an individual's boundaries in order to achieve boundlessness that is predicated on, quote, the pleasure involved in violating one's self-image, a pleasure in tension with that of secure boundaries and self-recognition, Dean elides Bersani's focus on being penetrated, not doing the penetrating, as well as Bersani's assertion that, quote, it is the self that swells with excitement at the idea of being on top. Dean's top-centric perspective of barebacking then may actually replicate rather than undermine normative heterosexual male attitudes towards and assumptions about sex and the accompanied self-shoring. As Bersani notes, quote, the logic of homosexual desire includes the potential for a loving identification with the gay man's enemies. Dean's assertion that, quote, self-identified barebackers represent themselves as ubermen, as sexual professionals, experts in eros, and as outlaws, pioneers of the erotic avant-garde, harkens back to Versani's caution that gay eroticization of masculinity is not necessarily subversive, and in fact, often is not. Arguably, this makes bareback tops the opposite of the erotic avant-garde, indeed, the aspirational old guard. Far from embracing subjective risk, such theory and practice could be considered to parasitize the risk of bottoms while aspiring to spoils of heterosexual masculinity. Cindy Patton's assertion in Fatal Advice that, quote, there is only one dangerous act, being fucked without a condom, that sole act which is invoked by the national pedagogy as the citizen's freedom, seems just off. Getting fucked without a condom is not what the citizen hoards, but rather it's reverse encapsulated in Patton's follow-up. Quote, having license to fuck without a condom is the new all-American fantasy of heterosexuality rescued from queerness. To fuck someone else, that is. This is the freedom that Dean seems to desire, to be an all-American top with everything else bottom value. 
In Mediated Intimacies, Dean, like many others, refers to PrEP and incidentally the pill as a quote, chemical condom, a misleading phrase as to what both pharmacological interventions are and do. Pregnancy is a fundamentally asymmetrical risk, but so too is HIV transmission. As Cindy Patton and Hai Jin Kim note, the largest scale PrEP trial, the IPREX trial, recruited its queer male participants because they had quote, moderate levels of unprotected receptive anal sex. PrEP has been targeted towards and tested for bottoms from the outset. In this, it differs from Gardasil, the HPV vaccine, whose discursive and sociological gendering is not intrinsic. As Marie Thompson notes, in the FDA hearing for Gardasil, Merck Pharmaceuticals sought its approval for both boys and girls, given HPV's role in oral, penile, and colorectal cancers, as well as cervical cancer. Arguing that its approval only for girls and women stems from gendered social relegation of responsibility for risk management. As a result, objections to Gardasil have been profoundly gendered. Like invectives leveled against Truvada whores, much invective leveled against Gardasil has been distinctly slut-shaming. Colin Hart, the director of the UK Christian Institute, referred to it as, quote, basically a sex jab, encouraging the view that girls can be sexually available. And Stephen Green of Christian Voice claims Gardasil vaccination is, quote, treating these girls like tarts. The recourse to discourses of responsibility, community, and respect surrounding both PrEP and Gardasil are even more pertinent. Advocating Catholic resistance to HPV vaccination, F.B. Henry, the Bishop of Calgary, bases his argument on, quote, the call to respect dignity, promote justice, and foster trust, respect for life and the common good. Christian anti-vaxxer Nicole Dila writes that in rejecting Gardasil, quote, I expect that my daughters will not seek out the company of a member of the opposite gender who cannot respect them. I expect that they will be raised with an integritous group of friends who will help keep them accountable. Mobilizations of respect, community, and the common good, reliant on the risk of girls, resonate with community-centric criticisms of PrEP. J. Brian Lauder associates condom usage with, quote, communal care, quote, good gay citizenship, and, quote, gay civility, to which he positions PrEP in opposition. Echoing Christian fundamentalists, Lauder links risk with an ethic of community care in claiming, quote, this was the plague's silver lining, this awareness that we had a responsibility to each other, that our individual lives did not play out in a vacuum. The common thread is positioning bottomly health risk as necessary cost and also guarantor of care, respect, and good behavior on the part of the community as a whole. While the need for pharmaceutical interventions like PrEP and once again, the pill and to a certain extent Gardasil are certainly partially a risk of top supremacist culture, the implication of claims like Lauder's that the association of condomless sex with intimacy, which, quote, reeks of phallocentric top superiority privilege, will somehow be resolved by rejecting bottom controlled pharmaceutical solutions is unsupportable. Structural disparities between men and women, between tops and bottoms, do exist, and rejecting pharmaceutical solutions that are, in fact, nothing like a chemical condom in terms of who possesses the usage control does nothing to solve them. Indeed, bottom approaches to risk are not necessarily commensurate with the theories espoused and promoted by tops. John Byrne, a self-professed bottom who prefers condomless sex, explains, in contradiction of Dean's account of sort of the subversive potential of health risk and joyous exploration thereof, um, so Byrne uh, explains, quote, I generally only had condomless sex, and as a result, I rarely had sex at all. As a gay man who has receptive sex and who lives in Miami and Washington, D.C., the cities with the first and fifth highest HIV rates in the U.S., I knew how high my risk was, and for the most part, I wasn't willing to chance it. Contrary to Lauder's assessment, Byrne represents his experience as one of community investment and caring. A friend familiar with his situation suggests prep to him, and Byrne discusses also having 
prospectively avoided zero conversion because a friend gave him two testing kits for his visit to a long distance lover who was, as it turned out, newly positive. From Burns' perspective, quote, like birth control, PrEP empowers the receptive partner. It also recognizes the vulnerability of the human condition. Rejecting such empowerment in the purported interest of utopian communal empowerment instrumentalizes the risks experienced by bottoms for the sake of everyone else's future fantasized well-being. Here we find a renewed and concluding connection with the issues of value, politics, and subversion. Both Gardasil and PrEP-related discourses often make recourse to fears not only of increased promiscuity, but prospective health risks related to pharmacological intervention. Larry Kramer fam famously claimed that with PrEP, quote, you're taking a drug that is poison to you and it has lessened your energy to fight, to get involved, to do anything. Here, pharmacological intervention is represented as prospectively poisonous, not only to the body itself, but to the body politic. Bottomly risk once again emerges as central to a queer political ethos insofar as it involves a baseline level of health risk. In her position paper for the Institute for Catholic Bioethics, at Moira McQueen similarly mobilizes prospective health unknowns about Gardasil in conjunction with an appeal to community and individual responsibility to then claim that, quote, if there is a rush to implement general screening programs for girls from grades six or grade eight onwards, without further reflection on these concerns, then something is sadly out of kilter in how young girls and women are valued in today's society. Ultimately, bottom value is mobilized in these discourses in ways that are utilitarian, often parasitic, and largely unconcerned with the concerns of bottoms themselves. Bottoms are both immensely valuable and not in these discourses. Their subjective and health risks underlie queer theoretical claims of subversion and political motivation, while the specificity of bottoms themselves often seem to disappear often seem to disappear in such appropriations. At the same time, asymmetrical risks to bottomly health are valued intensely, but only insofar as they make bottoms the custodians of community respect, responsibility, and the common good. Goods that bottoms are, of course, somehow framed as unworthy of themselves. Thank you. Jordana, thank you. That was fantastic. Another very kind of rich and sophisticated paper for what has been a really enjoyable panel so uh, thank you all of you i'm gonna do my best this is my first time chairing a zoom thing so there's a lot of conversation you'll see a lot of standing for everyone um so what i'm gonna do is as i say my best and i'm gonna go through what looked what looked like actual questions as opposed to kind of discussions within the um within the audience and so if any of you do have further questions please just add them now and i can do my best to ask them so the first question is from um gary needham to angelos so um angelos do you consider the difference between hollywood and the independence reality bites for example is also at the tail end of new queer cinema uh, like films like poison the living end etc and there is a distinction between hollywood or normative desexualized and American independent cinema going back to buddies, parting glances, and long-time companions, so on. So, okay, Angel, are you, are you thinking about the differences between these two kind of genres of American film? Um, I, I don't actually focus on your mainstream uh, representations at this point, mainly because I think, um, at least to my mind, the audience is sort of more representative of people who are not in the know. So when we talk about independent productions or it's the same like with theatre, for instance, if it's not a mainstream stage, you are sort of preaching to the converted in a sense. So I'm, I, that's why my examples all came from very mainstream um, Hollywood productions. Okay. Um, Gary, was there anything that you wanted to say in response? Let me know. Okay. Okay, thank you, Angelos. Um, he's muted. He's muted. Okay. Well, he, 
We have to unmute him, Gary. Gary is now unmuted. I should have said that. Was there anything she wanted to say? Yeah, unmuted and visible. Um, no, I just think it's interesting and, and definitely the, the mainstream needs as much critique as we can throw at it in terms of how it represents any form of gayness or queerness or, or that. It was just that in tandem a lot, and, and why I mentioned American independent cinema is it, it's, it was actually, some of those films were more popular than films like Reality Bites. And um, partly because they had really good distribution coming off the back of the success of uh, Sex, uh, Lies and Videotape. So there's a lot of, I mean, I think we need to be careful making claims for certain films that because they look kind of normal and mainstream that they were actually widely distributed or exhibited like Reality Bites when in fact many of the queer films uh, like Safe had much more visibility. So I think it, I would urge caution of making general claims about certain films without knowing how they were distributed and marketed and how many people seen them because the independent versus Hollywood is a very kind of slippery uh, binary by the time we get to the 1990s and many of the hit films of the 90s are not studio films but actually independent films like Shakespeare in Love and uh, Pulp Fiction. Um, but yeah, I can see that looking at mainstream films that is quite helpful but I think it's not it's only part of the picture really and that there's an important history there of queer filmmaking and its moment of visibility through new queer cinema that that adds to the uh, that, and that includes something like the celluloid closet which is has its own problems which was distributed by Miramax and um, as was Paris is burning by Miramax all pretty phenomenal releases at the time because it was a particular moment when independent cinema was more important than Hollywood. So it was just kind of urging caution about the different the differences between mainstream and independent and that slippage between the two needs to be kind of less rigid, I guess I would say. Yeah. Angelos? Oh, absolutely! Absolutely, I've I've I kept notes uh, basically of what you said, and thank you for that. My main my main question, which is so totally not academic, when I choose material to analyze, when it comes to that mainstream, it's not about distribution, but it is: would my mother watch this? And 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 she wouldn't because th those films would not be available to say our country, for instance, as a, as a non-English speaking country, um, hence the choice, but I will um, definitely take that on board. Thank you. In Joao uh, has posted a question which kind of speaks to this discussion. Joao, do you want to, I mean, maybe the issue here is one of publics and whom are these various productions, Hollywood or independent, trying to address and how they come to shape a dominant form of representation of POS bodies? I don't have anything to say. I mean, I think there was, I think, um, yeah, I think the, the issue of who, who, who are these, these productions, because, uh, and again, I, I would echo Arelo's <laughs> comment, you know, everybody back home watched Philadelphia, not every, nobody, <laughs> at least, you know, like nobody in my little village in rural Portugal watched uh, any, any of the other, <laughs> you know, independent uh, queer or new queer, new queer cinema. So, I, you know, it, obviously, it, it, I think it, there is certainly a case to be made about, about global distribution and, and, and the kinds of, uh, what becomes a cultural reference point for for representation of HIV? But that but it was just a little comment. I may have already a question. I may have, however, a question. <laughs> if you let me, Jamie. Um, well, I have a question for Chess and Christian, but I also have a question for Jordana. So I don't. I may go. I may go with Jordana just to to ask you. Uh, I really. I mean, that was a really incredible. Uh, paper and uh, I really like, 
I really resonated with the, your kind of reading of, of many of these, these authors as, at least as authors, as, as writing from a top, a position of a top. Um, but I think maybe it's, a, it's some ask, to ask you to, to maybe if you have any, any thoughts or on, on something that I always find, found really, if you can expand on something that I found always really troubling, which is that in both Bersani and Dean's work uh, and, and a lot of similar queer or, or gay male writers that, that the way in which they write about sex is, and even the way in which they conceptualize jouissance uh, in their kind of Lacanian uh, background seems to be seems to be to me a deeply uh, phallic understanding of what sex is and what sex does does to to subjectivity and they may be may be related to to your your association of them being uh, tops um, but I always found that that troubling I always found that even the way in which this kind of self obliteration or self or self um, annihilation, this kind of death drive was still very much to me, uh, you know, as a bottom, <laughs> something that always felt really uh, very much dick driven. Um, even Berzani in his like latest, uh, uh, what is it called, receptive bodies, seems to be talking about receptivity as just, you know, this kind of impossibility of actually getting the dick in you and the dick staying in there. So uh, can you kind of, you know, maybe you have any thoughts about how we could kind of reconceptualize these, these phenomena, which are still really interesting, these kinds of affects and sensations and, and this kind of idea of jouissance uh, around something that could be less phallic? Um, I mean, I don't, I, I don't disagree with you that it is quite phallic. I think more so in Dean than in Bersani because Bersani is, like much more focused on um, on on receptivity, um, and is sort of largely actually dismissive of the subversive potential of um, the possessor of the phallus that is in in motion, as it were. Um, but I am not necessarily sure that that model of of sexual receptivity and like the death driviness of it is so fundamentally phallic as all that because it also comes up in like lots of like bottom narratives of, in like queer women's writing and literature and culture like this sort of framing of like getting fucked or the experience of getting fucked and what that does to the the subject in terms of like over what self overwhelming sensation um comes up more broadly and i mean that might just in part be due to the degree to which we are imbued socially in terms of our like ways of formulating eros by that sort of psychoanalytic framework that is still with us and therefore is by extension phallic even in contexts in which there is prospectively no phallus at all um but i i'm i'm not sure that it's like that framing of being fucked is so is so restricted to to like a phallic an overtly phallic centered context I would, I would say, and I, I mean, even if we think back to, you know, a couple of, of days ago, um, Elliot's paper um, on uh, fatigue, right? Like fatigues, uh, le corps lesbien, which I've, which I've written on more than once. So I was like quite excited to see that book come up is like obsessed with penetration among other kinds of sensation and all kinds of extreme penetration of like every possible orifice and creating new orifices etc but there's no dicks like there's no phallus it's everything that could possibly go into anything goes into anything 
and you transform into creatures that have even more things that could go into things, but there are no dicks. And yet it does have sort of that similar formulation of the like death drivey overwhelming experience of being fucked. So I think there's something about that that isn't necessarily reliant on the presence of the phallus in terms of how we like move away from that formulation of receptivity that I'm, I'm not sure, you know, in terms of like a practical sense for me, um, one of the things that I always find aggravating is this idea of like the dildo as being attached to the top, like that, that is part of the, the top in the sense that like, it is associated with chosen by part of the identity of, whereas really the dildo should be mostly part of the bottom because it should be like chosen to best please the hole that it is going into, as opposed to like the body that it that might be wielding it. Um, and I think moving sort of more into that that framework is maybe like something of that direction. Uh, but it's a great you. question. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, there's another question in the chat that was asked earlier for Chase and Christian um, from Aaron. He says, thank you for the really great talk. Um, I missed a minute or two of the paper, so I apologize if this question has already been addressed or is off topic. I'm wondering the scope of your argument. How would actual material access to PrEP affect the kinds of sociability you are describing and theorizing via drag slash ontology? I'm wondering whether people who have ready access to PrEP experience that dragging in a different way from those who have unreliable access to it? Chase, uh, do, you, do you want to say something? Why don't you go first and we'll see what's left. <laughs> right. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, as I started to just read the, in the chat, um, I, that kind of localization is, of course, very important. And it's really nice that you give us this opportunity to say that, of course, <laughs> this is this analysis doesn't, you know, just, just distribute equally across every, you know, area of the world. Um, so definitely, um, there's something to be said about that. Um, and it just made me think that uh, you're right, but also in terms of uh, LGBTQ organizations or whoever uh, kind of like distributes or do not <laughs> distribute but like could distribute PrEP in a given region are very important to consider like the way that they frame it like who is it accessible for what kinds of sexual practice do we frame this as as like an important way of informing and understanding how this uh, PrEP whole figure or whatever might move around. Um, I just wanted to add also that of course, what we were trying to do was that we were looking at the prep hole figure um, in relationship to the prep hole figure. And there's, of course, um, other figures out there that organize thought around prep. And this is just one of them. And, you know, in terms, it can feel like a little bit of an old one, but I feel it's still, it's still uh, useful. And in the context of this conference, like maybe the pick figure would yield different uh, results. But we hope to just demonstrate that this ontological framework uh, infused with feminist and effective temporal works of Freeman and, and Ahmed, what they can do for us in terms of understanding how PrEP is lodged in different uh, current gay uh, infrastructures. Yeah. Chase, is there anything to say? No, I think you've done it brilliantly. Very good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I have a speculative question from Jason. So, Joao, if you can unmute um, Jason, then he can ask Jordana a speculative question. Thank you kindly, Jamie. Um, I'm hoping that I'm unmuted. It says yeah. I'm not allowed to. Uh, okay, thanks. <laughs> I can see Chase nodding. Um, three super papers. Jordana, I'm just, I cannot wait to see this published or a version of it published. I, I cannot wait. This is so exciting. Um, I say a speculative question, be, question because I want to um, I, I'm kind of responding a bit to what Juan was asking about. Uh, so it's, it's, if you like, a progression from that. Um, it seems like what we're all talking about is the conflation of ideation or intention with behavior within a value system. And this is, this is what this story is about. And um, 
what I'm thinking about is corollaries that your arguments might have for two other kinds of sexualities that don't get discussed very much. One of them is um, the, the side, as opposed to the top or the bottom, um, in whom, for example, um, I suppose an affective investment with the death drive or with self-abnegation may or may not coexist with an activity that to most people would appear to have nothing to do with any kind of fundamentally shattering or transformative encounter. I mean, we're talking about plugging, which is visibly um, dramatic versus rubbing, which isn't necessarily, or even nuzzling. Um, so, I mean, I know that this has been talked about in, in the context of the stone butch, but I'm wondering about other kinds of relationships in which um, even penetration itself is not necessary. Um, I'm also wondering about ego hostility as a, as a mode that needs to be figured on its own right, independent of any sexual practice. This would help with understanding um, straight male passivity, straight male sexual passivity, which is also very much um, under discussed. And so um, I realize that, that that's not really a question. It's a, an associative collection of different areas in which your, your theory might uh, be very helpful and illustrative. But I'm just wondering what your reaction might be to those uh, suggestions. Oh, Jordana, we can't hear you. Yes, I just realized I was still muted. Um, I mean, you you raised the, um, the 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 stone butch as sort of an example of like the side, but I actually would consider like the stone butch as an example of the kind of total top that I'm talking about. Because even if there isn't the same sort of like health risk in, in play, um, uh, in terms of the sort of like subjective risk and self-shattering versus shoring up of self, I think like the person who only fucks someone else with a dildo and does not allow themselves to be like touched or penetrated in those kinds of areas, that would be someone who I would consider to be a total top within that discourse. Um, that said, um, I, uh, yeah, I'm seeing in the, in the chat, but yeah. Um, I think, yes, our, our discourse of sort of like what is rewarding or subversive or important about sexuality doesn't really tend to have much space for sort of, I guess, the like less explosive sensations or the less sort of like polarized between like um, self-shoring and like self-shattering. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how much room we do have like in terms of established sort of formulations of like the erotic or sexuality to engage with that. I also think they're sort of at this like weirdly sort of politically risky realm where it's very easy for sort of like valorizations of that to slide into like conservative sort of ideas of of like sexual ethics that tend to be um very rejecting of like that which is perverted um while at the same time there's like very generative and like positive things we could get at through that theorization but that's really tenuous because the one place that i can think of where there's a lot of talk about that is sort of like second wavy lesbian separatism and like sex wars era idea of the like perfectly egalitarian non-penetrative lesbian sex that involves like a lot of mutual caressing and no one's subjectivity is destroyed because there is no such thing as topping or bottoming because it is this like perfectly equitable experience of like 
sisterhood and women loving women, perhaps who aren't even really attracted to women because political lesbianism is a desirable thing in terms of the rejection of heterosexuality. And you sort of like gently caress each other in this like absolutely non-explosive manner. Um, and I don't think that that theorization, like I think there's definitely room in the need for theorizations of those sort of like beside Miss feelings, but also there's like, there is this sort of history and propensity of like raising the value of those or central centralizing the value of those towards this sort of like conservative, like programmatic sexuality where it's like everything should be this like cuddly thing. Um, thank you for that. I had to mute myself because I laughed out loud. Um, I'm actually going to take chair's privilege and it speaks a bit to what you've just been talking about and um, as yeah, an interesting conversation now happening in the chat. Um, yes, it's, I mean, it's, it's a question that uh, it's actually to Jordana um, uh, on this question. And it's a question I keep coming back to throughout this conference in some ways. And it's about the investment um, within the, that people have or the, the, the queer theory or the you know ordinary people have in these kind of categories and I just I'm wondering to which point and it, it just speaks to what you've been talking about the the, the points to which um, how overdetermined are these ideas of top and bot bottoming how overdetermined are the ideas of these are your um, something that you do become some someone who you are um, how much is sex always about penetrability how much is um, uh, sex was about fucking um, and and so i i am always uh, sitting through a lot of these presentations and i'm wondering those questions that there is that these categories exist and there is a, a real investment in them and i'm not sure that they always work to describe what goes on in actually existing sex aside from your hilarious description of sisterly uh, so yeah i just i mean uh, yeah, I just wonder what you think about that, Jordana. I mean, I I do think they're they're hugely overdetermined categories, and I I would think that um, probably uh, like Chase and Christian's research might also be relevant to that. Um, that doesn't always necessarily have to do with what actually goes on in sex. And I think like one of the ways in which that's overdetermined is I think the parallel that we can see between like attitudes towards a claimed versatile identity and attitudes towards a claimed bisexual identity, which is, oh, no one is really that. They're actually just like going to be gay eventually and saying that, or they're actually just really a bottom who are, who's saying that um, versus, you know, there's, there's a similar discourse of like, that's not a real thing. You can't be both. You can't really be both. You're really just more one or the other and you're reluctant to claim that. Um, whereas in, in fact, people often are versatile, if not necessarily always evenly so. And yet I do think there are ways in which um, those sort of very overdetermined and, and reified identities do play out on the ground in people's sexual behavior, right? Um, and this isn't this isn't just sort of like anecdotally, experientially, although that as well. Um, but in, in not in this sort of conference length version of this paper, um, but there is some research. Um, like some ethnographic research on uh, attitudes of tops and attitudes of bottoms towards um, condomless sex. And it's trying to do it in a very non-essentialized way. It's actually looking at top narratives and bottom narratives. So some of them are from the same people, like it includes people who are versatile prospectively. Um, but that does show a very different attitude and show a very different attitude that kind of does uphold these sort of like power structures that map 
very neatly onto sort of similar dynamics in like just very conventionally heterosexual dynamics in terms of like around condom usage specifically, right? Once we get into, into prep, it's getting into a, a different sort of area and a different dynamic, though much like the pill, it can also have the sort of problem of then there's the expectation that if you're going to bottom you must be on this and why should anyone have to bother with anyone else regardless of your reasons. Um, but in short, yes, I do think they're very overdetermined. And I think there are ways in which that does and does not hold up in, in actual sexual practice. But some of the ways that it does hold up are very sort of relevant to those sort of issues of like, what is the meaning and purpose and nature of these sort of interventions in, in health risk. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, totally. Um, okay, thank you, Susanna. And there's, uh, Brian is um, building on that and asking Chase and Christian um, a question and their analysis of apps. How much do these positional identities owe to the format and available taxonomies that are handed to us by the apps? Christian and Chase. Chase, have you had the chance to, to think about that? Yeah, I'll just have a couple of words. I can't speak directly to the, the infrastructural nature of this, because I think Christian is probably a, a bit more of an expert about this than me. But I was thinking about um, especially the ways in which I've seen Grindr um, developed during the COVID crisis. Um, and I wonder if there is a question here of also what are the, the um, motivations of the, the, the producers, the um, developers themselves who are thinking about um, who are their audiences. Um, and not, not only that, but thinking about um, what are they trying to confer to these audiences? So why I bring this up is that during COVID, we've seen a whole lot more um, digital ads. We've seen a whole lot of um, these, these kind of uh, portals where you have to watch a video for, um, for like five or 10 seconds. At least it's here in the UK. In Scotland, it's just been, it's just been madness. So I wonder if that also um, kind of tangentially relates to um, whether or not they're willing to make changes to the ways in which we can, they, can, they in particular conceptualize who is using these apps. Is it consumers? Is it people who are just casually looking for sex? Are these ne necessarily related to another? These consumers are people who are looking for sex and vice versa. Um, and then can we entangle those two? Does, is Grindr as an app willing to entangle those things to allow for more categories to become part of their apps? I don't know. Um, on to you, to Christian. Yeah, I I don't think I have anything uh, really great to say about this. I'm still thinking about it. I'm just because like these categories that we were interrogating, of course, comes like they're framed in a very like monetization, you know, system. You know, it's very it's very unclear where they came from, and we in interpreted them from a, from a stance of like HIV activism, which which of course is very well described in the HIV literature and. So you could take other approaches to them. Uh, I just want to note, for example, during the Black Lives Matter um, movement and the kind of explosion, how Grindr removed the ethnic uh, race categories as a way to like sort through uh, um, profiles, which kind of like just like and it's been a long push for many years, like discussing this, and, like so so there's like this permanence, but then it does happen, and so it's also it's not only about what is categorized, but also the amount of stuff that is categorized, and like they can actually remove all this stuff, and we'll still be using these apps. Um, so yeah, that was just like a random thought that I came in with. Okay, I think we have time for one last question, uh, which Joao wants to ask Christian and Chase. Yeah, thanks, um, guys. That was really, really good. Uh, uh, fantastic paper, and I was really, really taken by that idea of how you were using the idea of, uh, of ontology and the and spectral spectrality in relation to, to PrEP. Um, my question is, well, okay, it's like a, a way, but what is the value? You mentioned uh, actor network theory. What, what is the, what is the of, of, of uh, or on such kind of, of conceptual, particularly in, in relation to maybe the ways in which take into account um, 
particularly in which it's, it's kind of like flat ontology that it is into account. Uh, uh, cultural and political history, um, and 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 you know other things that, uh, and, and the differential agent uh, agency or affordance uh, of, of other things that may not be uh, you know marked or 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 uh, mapped onto this kind of idea of a, of a network of, of equal things that together act in the world, if you see what I mean. <laughs> Basically, I have a beef. I have an issue with actor network, <laughs> network theory, and I want you to help me <laughs> out. Um, so this sounds weird, but like, did it all you, like, because I didn't hear half, like, the sound totally went out. So you I sound like right. what you asked me. <laughs> oh, OK, I, I will summarize uh, shorter. Uh, what are the values and potential limitations of using actor network theory to talk about this that you've discussed. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, disclaimer, I'm coming from a kind of a delusion uh, inspired position, and I'm very suspicious of actor network theory. On what, what do you think the limitation is? I, th I mean, I, I, I I mentioned, maybe you got a question, I think that it risks overlooking uh, political and cultural histories as well as uh, inequality, uh, inequality that it tries to map through this idea of, you know, flat ontology of everything in the same ontological footing, having the ability to create uh, a relation that acts in the world, right? Right. Um, so I am not an expert in disentangling the separation between these two uh, directions that you're gesturing at. So take this as whatever <laughs> you want. But um, in terms of, I see your point, in, particularly in terms of the um, the uneconomic, like the uneven distribution in terms of like who this is even accessible to. Um, but in terms of um, the, the former uh, point about histories, I feel we did, well, maybe that wasn't ANT then, but I feel like we did try to address how uh, HIV histories of activism actually, um, you know, uh, reemerged and uh, moved through these infrastructures and how they informed these categories and, and, and they did some work. So I feel we did some historization work there. And in terms of ontology, um, I think it's a, it's a, it is a framework that actually allows us to consider this multiplicity and overlapping and folding over. I guess that's a delusion. Yeah, but that's that's, that's yeah. exactly it. Right? No, no, no. That is, the, so the question was not about your presentation because I think you did a lot of that. Your, I think Chase mentioned that you are kind of building on, on actor network theory and and so my what why building on it right yeah because you're it's definitely something where i think maybe uh wait chase do you want to maybe i've been speaking a bit do you want to say something yeah sorry i'm trying to i'm trying to make sense of his, his cut up because i feel like i'm getting even more interference here anyway but um yeah, so I, I guess what the, the primary intervention here is, as Riles kind of suggested, is um, kind of trying to understand the relationship between affect theory and, and actor network theory and what our intervention is here. Um, and I think maybe we, I don't think that this paper in particular has really spoken to that kind of, that networked nest of um, how affects flow within um, the, the, the relationality of that network or that, that kind of um, spatialization of of encounters and embodiments. I think what our, our, our true intention with this paper in particular, and what I think you're kind of getting us, pushing us to think about, is whether or not affect can exist within this in a way that um, allows for, um, I, don't, I don't know if potentiality is the right word, but to allow for the multiplicity of, of the different words that kind of sometimes break systems, that when we reinterpret histories in particular, so when we think about futurities, how do futurities um, function within these systems? And I think it's a good question that I can't answer because I don't know if we are capable of, of 
or anybody has really elaborated upon this yet. So I think that it's a, an evocative question that maybe will help Christian and I as we continue to work on these ideas towards like what, what does it mean to, to recreate histories within these types of networks? I don't know. Yeah, and because you know, I, I know you were also interested in you know, uh, speculative methodologies and, and ideas of futurity, et cetera. And that to me seems to take us so much beyond the, the scope of ANT. Um, I totally, I totally, I totally agree uh, in terms of um, tracing effects. Like, I think maybe actually the uh, this what we've been talking about actually speaks more to a Deleuzian perspective in the sense that it traces affects and their mat materiality, like the relational to materialities and kind of like move and reattach and so on and so forth and kind of like how they stabilize the destabilize de certain events, right? We look at this, for example, these hookup apps, like that by, as, an, as an event, right? That draws in histories through these like affects. So, so, um, so yeah, I think maybe you're, you're getting uh, your Deleuzean police was like correct in like pointing out here where, where what's going on, yeah. I think what ends on the notion of the Deleuzean police, <laughs> <laughs> if that was the case, but um, thank you um, everyone for a really, really rich and generative um, panel. Um, I will now hand it over to Joao who will give details about Tim Dean's keynote tonight. Oh, yes, so uh, just a quick note about Tim's Keynote, 9 p.m., uh, so British summertime. Uh, I can't do the maths for you for your different time zones. I think it's 6 a.m. in Sydney, that much I know. Um, uh, keynote, so the keynote is entitled How Straight is Straight Masculinity. It's the closing session of the conference. I'll then try to do a kind of a short wrap up of some thoughts that stayed with me and kind of continued me throughout the conference. So, yes, and then I will have a drink and I will invite you to, if you attend, to have a drink as well. Uh, but yes, thank you so much, Jeremy. And thank you, everybody. Really three fantastic papers. Yeah. Thank you.